Hi everyone, my name is Alex. Welcome to this slideshow covering the reconditioning of my beloved, but nevertheless roughly 50 years old Swiss made Micron WF1 tool room milling machine. <laughs> I guess after 50 years of good work a machine deserves to be reconditioned, even if it is nerve wracking for the person pulling off the job. This slideshow I guess is for advanced machinists, not for beginners, since I do not show any basics here. It covers the scraping work, the repairs and modifications which I did on this machine from fall 2017 until spring of 2018. Furthermore, shown in the beginning are some of the immediate repairs which were necessary after I bought the machine in 2010. Sorry that I don't have any video material to show here, but this job was difficult enough for me as it is, without having to worry about lighting, audio and whatnot. Please note that I'm not a professional reconditioner and that this was my first machine tool reconditioning of such a magnitude. My scraping, spotting and measuring techniques are self-taught and there are probably better ways to get the job done. Nevertheless, I'm happy with the result and hope that you might find the one or the other thing of this video useful. The following pictures are not necessarily in chronological order since I arranged them by topic like disassembly, repair, scraping and so on. I bought this milling machine in 2010 from Mr. Feldman of Feldman Machine Trading in the Netherlands. Before I bought it, I drove from my home in Austria to his place to check the machine and then later the same day drove back home, totaling an 18 hour drive. <laughs> I wouldn't do this again, I guess I was a younger man back then. I don't know who owned the machine before me, but it was mostly in a well-kept condition. However, it needed some immediate repairs. One of these repairs was the drawbar which the machine was missing. Along with this I made the quill depth stop and the drawbar cover cap. These parts were missing too. The dimensions of these I could get from a WF1 mill which we have at work. This one is an earlier version than mine and made by Wilhelm Grupp of Germany who sold the design of the WF1 to Micron uh, around 1960. The X-way covers were useless at this point because the stiffening plastic sheets which were glued onto them on the inside were badly delaminated. So well, basically just cloth was left. I ripped all the plastic off and sewed the folds with the sewing machine. This provided enough rigidity to the cloth to get the covers functional again. Somebody had taken off the guide grid of the XZ shifter. I have no idea what the purpose behind removing it was, but I guess this allowed shifting the X and Z feet simultaneously. A dangerous thing in my opinion. Or maybe it just got lost, who knows. So I made a new guide grid and sealed it with a rubber bellow from tractor supply. Very important was refabricating a new Z-Way wiper. The rubber on the old one had large pieces missing. I drilled the rubber and metal strips off the carrying plate and riveted on some universal way wiper material which I cut accordingly. Works like a charm ever since. But then during the first few working hours I found that the quill clamp didn't work properly. It did clamp alright, but only to a certain strength. Cause of the problem was a broken lug on the quill housing. This gave me quite some headache, because I had a hard time to find a proper way to fix this. I didn't want to use solder here on the cast iron, because there are high stresses to expect. The solution I came up with was to make a steel clamping ring to slide over the to be modified quill housing. <laughs> Fun fact aside. Machining of this ring was done with a completely unclamped quill and a very nervous me. I designed the ring to closely fit the shape and look of the quill housing. That's why it's not simpler than shown. You'll get the idea in a moment. The quill housing needed modification to fit the ring. First step being hacksawing off the remaining lug. Then machining a new seat for the ring. I made sure to radius all the edges in order not to cause further cracks on the brittle cast iron in the future. 
This is how everything fits together. The side where I took the dimensions fits okay. Uh, you see it in the top of the picture. But there is a little step between the ring and the housing on the opposite side. I'm sorry machinists, but that's a job for car body filler. <laughs> I used three layers of fill primer on all the parts and dimensioned car body filler putty to level the step. After sanding everything smooth I applied another layer of fill primer and good old RAL 6011 green paint. Well, this is the condition how I used the machine for the past 8 years for many many hours. But then I taught myself to scrape and last year I decided to get rid of 50 years worth of wear in the sliding members and precision surfaces. I guess every reconditioning starts with disassembly and cleaning. This assembly of this machine is quite straightforward, aside from some details which were tricky to find and which I try to show in the following. The slides come off after removing their individual travel stops. After unscrewing of the Y-slide lead screw nut and after pulling out the gip, the slide came off quite easily. This immediately gave me a first impression of the slide's wear, like shown in this picture. Just compare the left part of the sliding surface, this one gets more pressure from the weight of the spindle head, with the right one. The scraping pattern is worn away on the left and still visible on the right. These pictures should give you an idea of the wear which the machine had. Interestingly, wear was pretty equal and amounted to approximately 20 to 30 microns on all the sliding surfaces. Taking out the feed gearbox was next and was quite tricky. Firstly because it is heavy. And secondly because I wasn't aware that I could take off the drive pulley and rapid traverse clutch first. Both of them are in the right of the picture. Later on I realized this and so assembling was easier. Not visible in the picture though are the two gearbox outputs. They are at the left and drive two chains which have to be removed first. This is the inside of the feed gearbox cover plate with the shifting levers. Next I took off the X slide. I had to remove the feed stops first then removed the lead screw attachment plates and then pulled off the slide. The lead screw doesn't unscrew in this configuration however because of a key. So I had to dismount the adjustable nut and pull out the nut with the lead screw. Then the nut unscrews from it. For removing the cross slide the feed stops have to be removed and then it can be unscrewed from the lead screw by moving the cross slide all the way to the top. After pulling out the gib, the cross light can be lifted off of the machine quite easily. This side probably didn't see daylight for half a century. The grease was quite disgusting as usual, but remarkably, remarkably soft. I assume this is because of oil leaking into the cross light and mixing with the grease there. The cross light is a complicated gearbox because it contains X and Z feed, there are reverse gearings as well as the X and C feed disengagement mechanisms for when you hit the feed stops. It took me half a day to figure out how this thing can be disassembled. Everything seemed to block another thing. But then I realized that the vertical feed disengagement lever has to come out first. For this you have to remove the two arms on it with a set screw and taper pin each. All of this can hardly be reached. Then with a sliding hammer you can pull the shaft out of the bottom through a hole in the wall. To remove the feed drive shaft you have to find and remove this particular key. It only showed up after I shifted the gears in the picture all the way down and lifted the castellated sleeve to the top. Then finally I could start to clean the parts. Interestingly, the original paint on the cross slide was not resistant to solvent, while the paint on the other parts was. So during cleaning I simultaneously removed the paint with beating strokes of the hand scraper. 
I was quite relieved after the cross slide became clean and after I found that none of the gears or brass bushings inside it needed replacement. Isn't it incredible how complicated this casting is on the inside? The wear on the cross slide was pretty equal to the wear on the Y slide. The scraping pattern is almost worn off. Here another fun fact, the three Gibbs on this machine have completely different oil pocket layouts. Gravity feed cannot be the reason for this, so maybe someone at Micron just wanted to show off here. <laughs> Who knows? This was paint removal of the machine's base and column. As with the other parts, I just did this with beading strokes of the hand scraper. This is a method that uses no consumables and produces almost no dust. All that remains of the paint are coarse chips. Cleaning the 50 years old gummy oil and grease inside the castings promised to be slave work. But my friend Walter, who is a very skilled car mechanic, recommended to me this cleaning compound over any solvent. I'm not affiliated with the manufacturer in any way, but let me tell you, this is really good stuff and works excellently for removing old oil or gummy grease. However, it's dangerous for your skin, for your eyes and lungs. So make sure to wear protection. Always. Everything cleaned up nicely with this stuff, even the underside and inside of the machine's base and column. Well, now let's see about the repairs. I always wanted to disassemble and check the machine's quill spindle. This is the only picture I have of it assembled, I'm sorry guys. In the highest gears it got a little warmer than I liked, but other than that there was nothing wrong with it from a machining point of view. I needed to make a wrench to loosen the fine thread nuts holding the quill together. There are three nuts, so I use both sides of the wrench. These are the three nuts, one holding a bearing in the housing and the others to set a preload and to jam it. The shaft then comes out with light help of the rubber hammer. The tool side needle bearing is press fit into the housing and so I made a custom pair of pulling arms to get it out. This is the slot where they insert. The bearings and bits lined up. This is the spindle's configuration. The tool is to the left, the drive is to the right. You see that the tool side needle bearing holding most of the radial tool loads runs on the hardened shaft. The axial tool loads are held by the two preloaded axial needle bearings to the right. The preload on them is set by the nut and jam nut on the shaft. What I found from inspecting the bearings was that the ones to the right were all fine. The needle bearing to the left, however, is not sealed and I assume it ground up the one or the other occasional chip which found its way into there. You see this on the rollers and by tiny marks left on their mating surface on the shaft. Now I had two problems. This precision needle bearing with P5 tolerance is not made anymore. It seems this was a custom order from Micron back in the day. But even if I had a new bearing, I couldn't let it run on a slightly worn shaft surface. The solution I came up with was to assemble my own precision needle bearing with selected needles out of new standard bearings. I found that brand make standard needles of appropriate size vary in diameter about 5 microns. I selected only the largest ones of almost equal diameter for my new precision bearing. Then I relapped the mating surface on the shaft. By this the shaft became a few microns smaller in diameter, not much but something. So next I assembled the quill and measured the radial play in the tool side. It amounted to about 4 microns. To get rid of this and to get the, bear the bearings slightly preloaded, I sent the new precision bearings outer ring to the electroplater. I instructed him to cover the rolling track with masking compound 
and to chemically deposit a 15 micron thick layer of nickel to the outer diameter of the ring, as shown in red in the picture. With chemical nickel plating, a very homogeneous and controllable thickness of layer can be achieved. That's why I chose it. However, the layer is not hard enough for the rolling track. Uh, that's why I had it masked. Plating the ring makes the press fit in the housing stronger and therefore elastically compresses the ring a bit to give the bearing a slight radial preload. Fortunately, this plan worked perfectly and it costs almost nothing. The quill spindle now has a radial runout of about 1 micron and due to the radial preload runs very smoothly. Making new drive packs finalized the quill repair. The rapid traverse clutch needed replacement because it sounded horribly. It was singing as we call it in German. Interestingly its friction layer wasn't worn much but it was hard as glass. So I turned it off on the lathe and had the clutch resold by, by a guy in Lower Austria who repairs the brakes on lumber industry winches. <laughs> he did a perfect job on this one. Next let's see about the scraping marathon. In case you wonder what this is. This is a remnant of the broken off end of a 250mm or 10 inch diameter cast iron rod. It was cheap and other, than, and other than the rough surface there was nothing wrong with it. So I used it to make a desperately needed spotting tool. This tool is an eccentrically drilled spotting plate with parallel faces. Fortunately I could use our heavy lathe at work for turning it. I needed this tool for example for spotting this particular surface, out of which the quill spindle drive shaft protrudes. Also it allowed me to check parallelism between the two faces of the quill spindle drive shaft housing. And the flatness of the rear face, as well as the flatness of its mating surface on the Y slide. The faces on the quill spindle drive shaft housing in the picture needed a little scraping touch, but Overall they were ok since they are no primary wear surfaces. The quill housing's back face was a bit worn and needed some scraping. I assume it was also a few microns deteriorated because of my modification with the quill clamping ring. I scraped it to be parallel to a test bar mounted in the spindle with the quill clamped. Having the quill clamped or unclamped makes a difference. It definitely changes the spotting pattern on the face a bit. Here the finished head on its holder. I made this holder out of a plywood sheet which I actually found lying in the street. Another fun fact I guess. The housing here is already painted grey but I'll talk about painting later on. This is the surface on the Y slide which mates with the quill drive shaft housing. I scraped the surface to be perpendicular to the horizontal spindle axis. Testing this is straightforward with an indicator in the horizontal spindle as shown in the picture. This surface was about 15 microns out of perpendicularity, which I assume was accepted at microns quality control back in the day. I scraped it to be less than 3 microns out of perpendicularity. How I spotted this particular surface you ask? Well, of course with the drilled spotting plate. Next I scraped the sliding surfaces of the Y slide. This picture was taken with 3 or 4 scraping cycles in the game. The quill housing and vertical spindle install at the right end and obviously their weight caused that most of the wear accumulated towards the right end. The aim in scraping the two blued surfaces here is to get them flat, to get them coplanar with each other and to get them parallel to the test bar mounted in the horizontal spindle. I continually checked coplanarity with the aid of this wel welded indicator base. The feet of this base are from an old ball bearing and are ground a little flat on, this, on the good surface of the belt sander. The clamp opposite of the indicator is to balance the setup for a good stand on the three feet. <laughs> Stefan Gotteswinter, whom you probably know from his YouTube channel, he always laughs about my indicator bases. 
But what can I tell you, they work nicely and consistently. <laughs> By using this setup like shown in the pictures and subtracting the forward of the reverse readings. Twice the difference in height between the surfaces is measured. In order to, to ensure coplanarity, this measuring technique must, must be employed on the outermost and the innermost portions of the surface. If there is no difference in readings over the whole slide length, taken innermost as well as outermost, the surfaces are coplanar. If not, one must simply continue to scrape the high portions. Testing for parallelism between the coplanar sliding surfaces and the test bar was easier. I welded up this base guiding the indicator along the slide. The ball's diameter should be chosen so that the feet in the foreground touch the tilted slide surfaces roughly in their center. The clamp and round stock in the picture are mounted to the base to balance the testing setup on its feet. Testing was done as shown with the indicator touching the test bar from above. Here the coplanar surfaces are in a quite finished stadium of scraping. Next were the two tilted slide surfaces. The picture gives you an impression of the wear. The aim in scraping the two tilted slide surfaces is to get them flat and parallel to each other as well as parallel to the test bar mounted in the horizontal spindle. Slight changes in the angle of tilt, if you ask for my opinion, are of no significance since the mating surfaces are fit to them accordingly later on. The angle of tilt on the gib side, however, should not be changed too much, or otherwise the gib will tend to drift sideward and will be difficult to adjust. This is testing for parallelism between the left tilted slide surface and the test bar. Note that this time the indicator touches the test bar from the side. Testing this worked well, but the indicator base shown here has room for improvement. If you space the two feet on the left further apart, you get less scatter in the readings. Here the first tilted slide surface in a quite finished stadium. The same had to be done for the second one, with one addition. I continually tested parallelism between the two tilted slide surfaces as shown here. Here the slide was close to completion as far as scraping is concerned. For viewing pleasure I also scraped and flaked the visible side faces of the Y slide, but since they are not functional I scraped them only to flatness. I'm sorry guys, but I have only one picture of the table scraping work. I had to do the table twice, you know, because I messed up the first flaking run. This is a quite final spotting pattern on the working surface. The surface was ground when I bought the machine and interestingly the left and right ends of the surface were about 15 microns low before scraping. I scraped the mounting surfaces not visible in the picture to be parallel to the T-nut slots and to be 10 microns out of perpendicularity with the here shown surface. This is to compensate for the deformation due to the tables and vices weight when mounted to the machine. At the final inspection 10 microns proved to be a fairly good number for this compensation. The cross slide did not require many scraping hours since the slide areas are small. However, checking its geometry was challenging, since the X slide is rotated about 30 degrees with respect to the Z slide. The aim in scraping the cross slide is to get all the, side, all the slide surfaces flat, to get the coplanar surface pairs coplanar, to get the tilted slide surface pairs parallel to each other and to get the X and Z slide perpendicular, perpendicular to each other. I started, I started with the coplanar surface pair of the Z-slide. Spotting these is easy since this can be done on the surface plate. Next I scraped the Z-slide's non-gibbed tilted slide surface. The gib side needed no scraping because there was no wear between the gib and its stationary mating surface. Next I scraped the coplanar surface pair of the X-slide. On all the machine's final surfaces I made sure to get a denser spotting pattern towards the surface ends, 
which ensures that you don't pr produce a convex surface over which you unintentionally rock the spotting tool. Testing the surface pair in relation to the z-slide was the tricky part and required a reference surface. I chose this one. I scraped it to be perpendicular to the z-slide. This perpendicularity is tested via this setup. Here my reconditioned frame level embodies the right angle. This is the indicator base used for this test. Again, there is room for improvement here, room for improvement here because the two feet in the foreground should be spaced further apart to give less scatter in the readings. Now back to the X-Slide coplanar surface pair testing. I continually tested for parallelism with the coplanar Z-Slide surfaces as shown here. In this setup, the indicator is guided along the reference surface, which we discussed just before. The reference surface is the one to the left, touching the indicator base. Both surfaces can be tested this way. But simultaneously they have to be tested for coplanarity, and I did this exactly the same way as shown before on the Y slide. I determined the difference between forward and reverse readings with the 3 feet indicator base as shown here. Readings must be taken along the slide as well as outermost and innermost. Alternatively, you can save some work by pre-calibrating the indicator on the surface plate as shown here. The final scraping steps on the cross slide were done on the non-gibbed tilted X slide surface. It is tested for perpendicularity in relation to the Z slide as shown here by using the scraped reference surface. At the same time, this test also ensures parallelism to the Z-slide coplanar surface pair. This is quite important because on the long run it ensures perpendicularity between the X and Y slides on the assembled machine. The other tilted X-slide surface needed no scraping because it stationarily mates with the gib and therefore had no wear. This is a picture of the X-Lite table with its vertical face already scraped. This face was originally ground and was roughly 10 microns convex. The picture shows testing parallelism of the reference surface with the T-slots. The reference surface is the one on which the part rests on the surface plate. I scraped the reference surface to be perpendicular to the face. This is tested as shown here with the indicator zeroed on my reconditioned frame level or my right angle master if you will. With the face and reference surface scraped, testing the sliding surfaces is an easy job. In this picture I checked the wear on the tilted slide surface. It was worn about 20 microns concave. During scraping I continually checked for parallelism between the coplanar slide surface pair and the face. Again, with the aid of the scraped reference surface, this is an easy matter and it pays off the effort for scraping the reference surface. However, the angle of rotation of the coplanar sliding surfaces with respect to the table's face must be matched to the cross slide. I tested this as shown here. The setup is without the gib, so the two clamps hold the sliding table with its reference surface parallel to the cross slide's reference surface. In this configuration, I checked the sliding table's face. I scraped the slide surfaces so that I had the face 15 microns rising along the blue arrow in the picture. I particularly chose 15 microns, 15 microns because I thought this would compensate the hang of the two parts on the assembled machine. If you bear with me through this video, you'll see if this was smart or not. After the coplanar surface pair was done, I scraped the non-gibbed tilted slide surface to be parallel to the face and the reference surface. But the angle of tilt may drift a bit during scraping and therefore must be matched to the cross slide. I checked this by bluing the sliding surfaces on the cross slide and assembling. This is an, inter this is an intermediate result of this check 
and shows a quite good mating of the sliding surfaces. By the way, this result also proves the validity of the forward and reverse coplanarity test I used. I finished the X slide table by scraping the gipped tilted slide surface parallel to the face and the reference surface. Then I did some hand flaking to give the part a proper look. Except of the gips, the column was the last and heaviest part of the scraping job. The column, however, is lighter than I thought. It only weighs about 190 kilograms. But still this is too much for handling, so I used my hoist for moving the column. The measuring techniques I used here are pretty similar to what I showed before. This is testing for coplanarity along with, with scraping the Z-slide's coplanar surface pair. Here a quite final spotting result on these surfaces. Next was the non-gipped tilted slide surface. After scraping it flat, I matched it with the cross slide. The technique is the same as shown on the X slide. Then I scraped the gipped tilted surface to be parallel to the other one. Here you see testing for parallelism, the technique is the same as shown on the Y slide. Next were the column's Y slide surfaces. For work on these, I placed the column on three feet. This picture gives a good impression of the wear on the coplanar surface pair. The surfaces were worn convex for about 20 microns. The blue line on the left surface is where the gib is located and therefore where the wear accumulated. I scraped the coplanar surfaces to be perpendicular to the Z-slide. I used my reconditioned frame master square and the 3 feet indicator base for testing. Since I didn't have a small surface plate, I spotted these surfaces with the straight edge. So I also had to continually check for coplanarity, which was tedious because of the oil grooves. Here a quite final spotting result on these surfaces. Finally I scraped the tilted slide surface to be perpendicular to the Z-slide and to match the angle of tilt on the mating surface. Before I started assembly I scraped the Z-slide gib because I had the column conveniently lying on its side. The material removed on all slide surfaces must be compensated for with the gib. Instead of making new gibs I used shim stock between the gib and its stationary mating surface. The shim stock thickness necessary in all my slides was about 300 microns. I scraped the first side of the gib to be flat and matched the other side to the column by bluing it in assembly. I'll show some pictures of this in the following if you bear with me until assembling the X slide. Scraping the gibs on this machine is a bit awkward since they are made out of steel not out of cast iron. Well, this almost concludes the scraping marathon, marathon, so let's move on to the painting part. On all cast parts of the machine, I used 4 to 5 layers of brushed on or sprayed on car body fill primer. The first three layers I generally applied wet on wet without intermediate sanding. Then I smooth sanded everything, which usually led to some through sanded spots on the rough surfaces. Then I sprayed on another layer of fill primer and finish sanded this one. Spraying the fill primer on gives less sanding work, but I only do spraying in the booth. Thank you Hermann, Danny and Kai for having me in your booth. The smooth sheet metal parts only needed one or two layers of fill primer and some finished sanding. After finished sanding and remasking all the parts, it was time for the paint. Sorry guys, I didn't stick to the old school RAL 6011 green, but rather I chose RAL 7035 light grey. Because my shop is dark enough as it is. I used two layers of acrylic top coat paint from Truck Supply. I'm quite happy with the result, but every paint job in the world has its defects and needs more or less finish work. The machine base and column were too problematic for me to transport to the paint booth, so I did all the prep work at my home shop and painted those two parts at a friend's place. This shows the surface after the, after the first three layers of fill primer were applied, right before the intermediate sanding. 
These parts also needed some filler putty because the castings were so wavy. This is the final layer of fill primer before and after finished sanding. My good friend Walter gave me the opportunity to paint these two parts in his washing booth. Thank you Walter and thanks dad for the transport. As you see I painted the column in the math trailer because I had no hoist or crane available. <laughs> That's not a fun fact, just plain improvisation. After hardening off the paint and hauling the parts home I could move base and column back to their former spot. If you're still with me and not yet bored to death, now we finally start reassembling the machine. I started with the Y lead screw. This is a picture of adjusting and measuring its axial play. The lead screw can be cranked by hand via this bevel gearing, which had to be adjusted as well. I, I checked the ad adjustment via bluing transfer on the gear's teeth. Next was the X and Z feed drive box, here at A. There is a peel shim between this box and the column. The shim had to be adjusted for the material which I removed by scraping off of the Z slide. The shim's plies have a thickness of 60 microns, so all I could do at this point was to remove one ply. This is a view of the backside of this drive box, which is driven by the main feed gearbox by a chain. With the two driven gears now installed, I reinstalled the main feed gearbox. This was easier than removing it, because this time I realized that I should do it without the rapid traverse clutch. Next I could pull in and tighten the two feed drive chains. Then I installed the feed motor and connected it with the gearbox with, of course, a new drive belt. Next was wiring the column. The left wire is the one for the spindle motor, the right one is a modification and supplies the DRO. I used the former coolant hole to get this wire through the column. And to properly clamp it, I made a custom holder looking just like the original ones, it is the one in the center here, with a rubber holding ring. Then I started to focus on the cross slide. I reassembled all the gears, bearings and levers and made sure to reinsert the hidden drive key which was so difficult to find during this assembly. Then I reinstalled the cross slide on the column with the Z slide lead screw and aligned the feed drive box. After this I prepared installing the X slide table. First the X slide lead screw had to be assembled. This picture shows adjusting its cartridge nut for axial play. With this setup, the wear on the spindle can be measured by comparing the axial play with the nut in the center and towards the ends. This spindle had about 180 microns of axial wear. I'm not bothered by this wear, since I don't use the lead screws on this machine for positioning anymore. For this I naturally use the DRO, so the lead screws are just for feeding. This shows the cartridge nut installed in the cross slide. Then I put on the X slide table and scraped its gib. First I scraped the gib stationary side flat, then I made it its sliding side to the table. The spotting technique I use for this is as follows. First I apply a quite thin and homogeneous coat of bluing to the gib sliding side as shown here. Then I install the gib, push it in and hold it with a wooden stick. And then I traverse the slide in the direction which does not pull the gib into the slide. Then I carefully take the gib back out. The high spots now are the light areas where the bluing was wiped off. This method only works well if the gib's mating surface is absolutely oil free and dry. I alternated spotting this way with spotting on the surface plate. This is how I held the gibs for scraping. I know, you guys will shiver because of me clamping it in the vise. But let me tell you, the gibs of this machine are thick and their sharp edges dig nicely into the soft jaws of the vise. I kept checking if any bending of the gibs results of this harsh treatment, but I found none. Scraping this way is very convenient because of the height of the vise. 
Next I installed and connected the electrical cabinet. And then the first showdown. Testing perpendicularity between the X and Z slides with the aid of my reconditioned master square. The result was an error of roughly 5 microns over 200 millimeters of travel. With the elastic deformation of the machine structure due to its own weight in mind, I am very happy with this result. So I could proceed with the assembly. Next I installed the table and the Y slide. Then I scraped the Y slide's gib with the same technique as shown before. The Y slide lead screw nut is shimmed and doweled to the Y slide. As before, I peeled off one layer of the shim to compensate for the material I scraped off of the Y slide. The sideward drift of the slide due to scraping I compensated for by making eccentric dowel pins. Now the second showdown. Testing parallelism between the Y slide and the horizontal spindle in both planes. The results were fantastic, the error in both planes being less than 4 microns over 200 millimeters of travel. <laughs> but with the, th with the third showdown the devil was not sleeping. Next I tested parallelism between the tabletop and the Y slide as indicated by the blue arrow. On a good machine of this design type, the table should rise about 10 microns to compensate for the weight of the work. In my case, table rise in relation to the Y slide was about 35 microns. Since the cause for this was not the table, I decided to scrape off 25 microns of the X slide table as shown here. So you see, my estimation of 15 microns rise on the X slide table, which I measured on the surface plate, was off. In fact, it seems that the X slide table installed on the machine does not hang towards the front, but rather leans toward the back of the machine for about 10 microns. This surely has to do with the position of the Z slide lead screw in the cross slide. And, well, I found out the hard way. This is difficult to anticipate. Next I tested perpendicularity between the Y and Z axis and the X and Y axis. While the latter was very satisfying, the former was off for about 20 microns over a travel of 200 millimeters. It was off even though I scraped an almost perfect right angle between Y and Z surfaces on the column. But the assembled machine elastically deforms due to the weight of all its components. I guess mostly because of the cross slide and table as well as because of the Y slide as the heaviest members. This it seems causes the column to deform out of perpendicularity for about 20 microns. At this point I needed a certain distance from the machine, sorry to say so, but I was exhausted with this job. After about a month, however, I felt fit enough again to scrape off these two errors. This of course required disassembling the X and Y slides again. So I scraped off 20 microns on the Y slides coplanar surface pair in the background, tapering off to zero in the foreground. Similarly, I scraped off 25 microns off the X slide table face, tapering off to zero at the top. Then I reassembled the machine, installed the DRO and retested the machine's geometry as shown before. The geometry still has arrows, as every machine does, but on this mill they are now all below 10 microns, tested with 200 millimeters of travel. To be honest, scraping required substantial effort, but I'm really satisfied with the result. Even though I don't know the tolerances which Micron used for the geometry of their machines back in the day, I'm quite sure that the geometry of my WF1 now ranks among the better or even maybe the best WF types which Micron produced. Forgive my arrogance if I'm wrong, but I'm quite sure about this. Lastly, I made some modifications to make work with this mill more easy. I never had a proper machine light on this mill. 
The one I had was a cheapo IKEA light which didn't keep its position and always sunk onto the work table. I wanted a proper and lasting solution for this, so I made a rigid holder to mount on some unused threaded holes in the column and invested in a universal Noga arm. On this arm I attached a 7 watt LED bulb and properly sealed the wiring. This light now is rock solid and as bright as daylight. I wired it just like the DRO to power on with the machine's main switch. And then finally I always wanted to modify this machine with a central oiling system to make the daily maintenance routine easier. While installing such a system is quite straightforward. Getting the oil into the right ports is not. Particularly challenging in this regard was the cross slide. The whole cross slide on the WF1 is oiled mostly by one port on its side. The blue arrow indicates where. There was a lubricating nipple installed at A. The red lines now indicate how oil from port A was fed to the lubricating manifold which is plugged to the outside at B. This manifold is a 14mm diameter hole almost all the way through the cross slide. Five lubrication holes are fed by this manifold and supply the X lead screw, the X and C slides and the shifting collars. I didn't want to drill any more lubrication holes into the cross slide for the central oiling system. I think there are enough holes in there already. But at the same time I didn't want just to feed a large amount of oil into the manifold because this doesn't ensure that oil flows into every lubrication hole. The ports which are more restricted than the others might receive, might receive almost no oil flow. So after thinking about this problem for some time I came up with the idea to make an oil distribution plug to be inserted at B into the lubrication manifold. Here are the parts for this distribution plug. The plug in the background carries five o-rings to seal the lubrication holes in the manifold from each other. Every section in this plug now is fed by a tiny tube, five of them in total. This plug then is soldered onto the labyrinth which installs to the side of the cross slide and carries the threaded oil port inserts. These two labyrinth sheets were machined by my friend Martin, the perfectionist. Thank you Martin. The plan was to silver solder the two sheets together. This is preparation for it with sheet solder and flux. Then I clamped the two sheets together and tack welded them so they, they and the solder wouldn't move anymore. Melting the solder could have been done with a good torch hand. However, I could use the vacuum tube furnace at work for this. By the way, this one is the largest tube furnace I could find back when we bought it at work. The 160mm diameter glass tube is pure quartz glass and costs as much as the whole furnace. But due to the nature of quartz, it is thermal shock resistant. This shows the view of the labyrinth sheets through the looking glass at vacuum. Nice thing about doing this under vacuum is that there results no oxidation of the part. Well, as I said, the devil is never sleeping. And after the first heating cycle it turned out that two of the oil tracks were not tight. Well tacking those two sheets together was a stupid idea. Because during soldering this kept the two sheets a distant. So I filed all the tacks away and re-soldered it a second time with individual weights on it to make sure equal closing pressure. The labyrinth turned out fine after this. Finally, I torch soldered the plug into the labyrinth, making sure to thoroughly flux and soak the connection to get the tiny wall seal. This was test fitting the plug onto the cross slide. To make sure that the first o-ring is sealed, I had to add one M4 screw to safely lock the labyrinth plate to the cross slide. It is the one in the picture with the chips. Finally I made the threaded connection block. This one carries five o-rings in grooves and is tack welded onto the labyrinth plate with the o-rings compressed. This shows the assembly installed on the machine. Here are the dimensions of the plug. 
in case anybody of you ever might need it. Another port which was difficult to modify for the central oiling system was the right hand one on the Y slide. The original oiling nipple there used to slide underneath the Y feed disengagement console. For hand oiling this presented no problem, but for a permanent connection it is. So I made the plug and labyrinth connector as shown in the picture. It is welded up from, from, from three pieces and carries an o-ring to stay sealed. That's another view of it. Most of the other oiling ports were pieces of cake modifications, like this one on the Z-slide lead screw. Other ports just needed to be threaded, that's it. This is the cross slide with the lubrication piston distributors, which make sure that every oiling port receives a defined amount of oil from the central pump. The distributor for the Y slide I installed below the spindle motor. This is the central pump which now makes my life much easier. Well gentlemen, I guess this is it. For me there were many lessons learned from this project, which took me about 5 months in my spare time. Frankly I'm very happy with the result, but I have to admit the project was not exactly as I expected it to be. After reconditioning the machine produces parts with better surface quality than before. It is notably more silent and behaves smoother during machining. The machine now produces parts with better geometry than before. Table rock with X traverse from end to end is now reduced to a minimum. The running spindle produces less heat. The rapid traverse clutch with its new friction layer behaves smoothly and silently. My father now finally is not disturbed anymore by the singing clutch during his after lunch nap. Cost for this reconditioning was a couple of hundred euros for material and parts and is almost neglectable if you consider the result. Not included in this number however is the cost of an appropriate surface plate, a straight edge and a test bar because I already had these things. But on the downside <laughs> The machine took me roughly 400 man hours to recondition and it requires a fair deal of dexterity, physical and mental endurance. I deliberately said man hours because most of the job is a quite physical task. I expected the most tiring part of it to be the hand scraping, but rather I found that most exhausting was the continual handling of the machine's heavy components for spotting and testing. This has to be done so repeatedly in addition to scraping that it is wearing out particularly the wrists, the lower arms and the shoulders. A machine of this size is probably the, the, probably the upper edge for reconditioning if you handle the parts by hand. Here the heaviest member is the Y slide which weighs about 70 kilograms or 150 pounds without the motor. Larger machines will no doubt require you to have or make lifting tools for the heavy components to aid in spotting on the surface plate and with handling, or at least you'd need a permanent assistant. Well gentlemen, this is it. Thank you very much for bearing with me until here and for not being bored to death yet. I hope you find the one or the other thing in this video useful or inspiring for maybe one of your own projects. All the best for your projects and thank you.